Hi, this is Lonnie, and I'm going to talk about my monarch butterfly operation that I have here in Berkeley, California. So I've learned a lot, and those of you who are on the call with me, we're all mostly pickleball buddies, and um, we have found during this COVID time uh, a wonderful hobby, and that is taking care of monarch butterflies. And we want to do that responsibly. So as you can imagine, there are a ton of different opinions about all of this. Just like uh, if we're looking at plants, you have some people who are, you know, only native. And if it's not native, you just got to rip it out. And then you've got people that are a little bit, you know, okay, you know, we're going to do the best we can, but we don't necessarily have to rip everything out. So I have been in groups. I have been um, studying this actually for a long time, six years. And I'm going to um, become an ambassador. Uh, and one of the things that for me, this has become is an educational tool. So um, I'll share with you. So this currently is my little setup. And now it's getting out of control because I've got about a hundred uh, monarch uh, either caterpillars or butterflies in different uh, stages. And I uh, have some plant, I have a plant over here <clears throat> where I have maybe 10 uh, caterpillars on that. And I also raise, but this is the last time I'm doing that, I also raise um, swallowtails, but right now I'm very busy with uh, what I have here. And this is just in one area in my kitchen, <laughs> not my kitchen, my dining room table. I have a huge amount <clears throat> of uh, containers. And let me show you one of those because then you get a sense about what I do with the uh, containers. And I'll be explaining all of this. So, uh, okay. Those of us who have been doing this a while, we have lots of pictures. <laughs> um, let me just get to the one I want to. <clears throat> oh, I know, I had it in favorites. Well, I, can't, oh, I have to show you this one. Are you ready for that? I had a sports section on the bottom of the cage and this is where the chrysalis made its chrysalis. I've got so many <laughs> amazing photos like this. But anyway, um, the photo that I wanted, I don't see here. But basically what it is, is that I have uh, containers where I have uh, eggs. And then when eggs pop into little, little, little microscopic caterpillars, I put them in another location. And uh, the main thing is that we want to keep these areas clean and we don't want them to be too wet. So when I, um, I'm going to see if I can find that while I'm talking. Uh, when I'm, uh, hang on one second, I do want to show it to you because that's kind of important. Okay. So here's the <clears throat> uh, little container that I have. And you can see the eggs. Uh, and so there's some small caterpillars in here. The thing is, you want to keep it clean. Uh, and those of you who have been doing this a while, you'll recognize that it's hard to keep it clean because they are poop machines, as Joyce would say. And they are indeed poop machines. I have little rocks. And I put rocks in there so that I can prop the leaves up because I try to keep the caterpillars from running around in the frass, otherwise known as poop. Um, and this makes it easy. These containers I found to be great. Um, <clears throat> I can let those of you know who are interested in the type of container. And then I, I missed it. So I take um, uh, a mister. I take just a mister and I missed it a couple times a day, but you don't want it to be really wet because you don't want mold to develop but just enough just to kind of keep everything a little bit moist, okay? And um, so I have like three of those containers now. 
The tools that I use uh, are a mister, okay, and uh, paintbrushes. So paintbrushes, because if you want to move a really small caterpillar and you have to do it, uh, then you can do it, you can, they'll attach themselves to the, um, to the end and you can move it. <clears throat> it's better not to touch caterpillars if you can avoid it. So if they're on the paper, I'll just cut around the paper and I put that little piece of paper on top of a leaf uh, so that it'll just crawl off, right? And remember also that caterpillars, they can uh, go off of the plant or off of the leaves for days while they're uh, shedding. And I killed a few initially because I didn't understand that. Oh, you've, got, you've gotten lost, you're off your plant. Well, uh, let's just say caterpillars generally know what they're doing. There's a few, there's always a few, right, Rebecca? There's a few <laughs> that just, you know, they kind of get lost or whatever. So, you know, yes, I do provide, I try to get them on the leaf at first. If that doesn't work, they'll take a paintbrush and kind of push them a little bit. So um, those are some of the tools that I use. The other thing is, is that when sometimes you're moving a, a, a caterpillar, it has this string behind it. And so it'll stay stuck to whatever it is. So you have to kind of like put your finger on it while you're removing the, the brush so that that little string detaches. So those are just some of the little pieces that uh, I do when I'm raising. Uh, these butterflies. And I also have a uh, monarch tiny tour. So my intention now is for education. But there's a question about uh, whether or not home rearing, home rearing monarchs is a good idea. If you, if you Google it, you're going to read a lot of opinions. I have read a lot of opinions. I've talked to a lot of people with a lot of opinions. I have my own opinions now. <laughs> and I think we can do it responsibly. And even, and I'm going to share with you now, um, this is from the uh, Monarch Joint Venture. And uh, <clears throat> this is quite good because they go into why, why not rearing monarchs at home. As many of you know, Monarch butterflies, and I'll show you some more of that in a minute, but monarch butterflies should be endangered in California. They're not having trouble in the Midwest. And um, there are infections they can get. I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, I protect for the main two that they're likely to get. But they should be on the endangered list. So is it helpful for those of us who are trying to help them? I think it is. And many do, if we do it responsibly. And that means making sure that in the best kind of enclosures are the mesh uh, cages that you can get. So there's air circulation all the time, keeping it clean, okay, and not overcrowding. So I know I was talking to uh, Christy in our group the other day, she's just gotten into it. And um, I said, she said, well, how many, you know, per 12 inch by 12 inch by 12 inch? And I said, well, really safely three to four, because three to four, caterpillars will eat an entire huge plant plus, okay? They eat a lot. It'll blow your mind when they get to that point. So if you're just starting out, I would recommend that. Robin, who's in the group here, and you know, maybe she'll talk a little bit too about her experience, but you know, she's been doing a long time, and so have I, so we've got our gig down. But in the beginning, I recommend starting off slowly. I have to share this with you in just a second. I just got this. Okay. <laughs> um, by the way, if any of you uh, want to talk, you can. There's a way that you can raise your hands, and some of you might actually leave now that I put this on. But anyway, I'm digressing. Um, <clears throat> so uh, anyway, uh, so responsible rearing. There's this thing about bleaching. Should we be bleaching all of our leaves before feeding it to the caterpillars? Um, should we be doing this at all? I've already answered that question. I'm going to go into what the uh, Monarch uh, Venture folks say. And pretty much they've all joined together in this conservation movement. Obviously, the most important thing is to provide food. 
um, and safety for uh, the butterflies. Uh, they're in trouble because of uh, Monsanto, loss of habitat, fires certainly didn't help during uh, migration. And um, a lot of, some of the diseases get worse towards the end of the year. Um, and I'll talk about that one in a moment. But a lot of times when they're talking about, uh, you know, rearing butterflies, there are groups that are doing this where they are breeding. And breeding is something entirely different. And some people are having weddings, and this still can happen. And they order monarchs online. Well, these monarchs have been bred in captivity. They get loose. And who knows how healthy they are? Well, they're probably not very healthy. We're not talking about that. We're talking about doing this for educational purposes and also to be helpful. So uh, you can look this up. Uh, there's a two page uh, thing. You can read the whole thing if you want, but I do want to get to the point, part here uh, where we're talking about quick tips for raising healthy monarchs. Keep the cage clean, keep milkweed fresh, avoid extreme temperature and moisture conditions. Um, I killed some of mine. Uh, and if you get into this, by the way, some of them are going to die. I had a small little container, I left it in the sun and it just got too hot and the little cats died. But in the wild, um, in the wild, 5% uh, if that live, okay? And that's because they have so many predators. There's, there's critters that eat the eggs. Uh, there are, and paper wasps will decimate caterpillars. I've had them take every caterpillar off of a plant. And then I started, you know, at times I started like killing the wasp. Well, I don't want to kill anything and all insects are in danger. So why not protect the monarchs? That makes a little more sense to me. And if you do it safely and uh, uh, you're going to produce healthy monarchs. And if they aren't healthy, and I just have to tell you this, if they aren't healthy, meaning their wings, they, you know, they come out, their wings are, are bent, uh, they, they have a gooey appearance. I mean, you know, I'll get into some conditions. You have to euthanize. I have had none of that this year. And by the way, one of the top infections called OE, which is where a lot of the concern comes from in terms of home rearing, doesn't happen as much here in, well, in northern states, drier climates. It tends to happen more like in Florida and the south and so forth. So um, while I have seen it, I have not seen uh, what uh, I hear some people are seeing for sure. So <clears throat> be conscious about disease, viral and bacterial infections spread very quickly from one cat to another. So keep containers clean and sterilize them often. I'll talk about that in a moment. Why to rear or not? Mass rearing of monarchs for release into the wild is not appropriate conservation strategy. And uh, that, that's what we're talking about here is, is, you know, people doing it in captivity and often to sell. People who wish to rear monarchs should do so in small numbers for outreach, personal enjoyment, or citizen science. And um, that's really what we are. So uh, in terms of uh, cleaning or being a little more aware of that, so again, I said my tools are like a mister, okay? Paper towels, you know, I just put a layer of paper towels. And by the way, I missed the paper towels before I put them in. And then I put the leaves in with the eggs and maybe I'll do a little, a little teeny mist again. I don't want to soak everything. And someone in my group today said that <clears throat> she has, I've never tried this, but it's a great idea, taken milkweed and put it in uh, the refrigerator and it last for two or three weeks. Fabulous. You can do that with the cuttings because uh, I'm going to get in trouble. My, my milkweed is going fast already and thanks to Jim who's also in our group, I put a message out on next door. I got 40 or so responses. I'm so excited. I will have plenty of milkweed <laughs> and because um, it's awful when you get towards the end of the year and you end up with 20 caterpillars and you're scrounging around trying to feed them, get them to flight. So 
I do want to share. Um, let me see here. Oh, I got to get that up first. <clears throat> I want to talk about milkweed for a moment and what we should be looking for. Uh, and Rebecca says, it says, release the butterflies close to where they hatched. How close is close? In your yard. And I think, um, uh, I think that's a great idea. And Robin and I both think, because Robin has done a lot of this too, when I, I, I don't know this for sure, but I think my monarchs come back to my yard. And when I let them out, I try to let them out on one of my plants. So just let them out within the vicinity. I mean, you can let them out in your city. I'm sure that's the same thing. But they, you know, the, in other words, in the area with which they came from, okay? That's the way to think about that. Okay, so I do want to talk about milkweed because there is a big to-do about milkweed. And um, most of us have, uh, uh, most of us have, well, this is showy milkweed. This is the type, I, I love this type. This is a California native. But most of us have, um, oh, let me look it up here, tropical milkweed. Because most are, so most of us have this kind, and that is tropical milkweed. Uh, this is what you see in nurseries most of the time, and this is what uh, this is what the native uh, plant people hate for a number of reasons. It's not, there, there are over a hundred different Northern California uh, types of milkweed. This comes from Mexico and it's, it is quite invasive and it doesn't die out. So in some areas, this is what they're saying is causing a lot of the uh, OE infection. I don't remember the full name of it right now. But the problem with it is this, and this is how you get around it being a problem. Uh, it doesn't die out in our area. Um, it doesn't die out in our area like, uh, say, showy milkweed. I'll show you another picture of that in a moment. Um, it tends to last through the winter here. So cut it back. Don't let it go to seed. You know, restrict it to your yard. Um, I connected with a, uh, a, uh, an, uh, special, uh, I can't remember the name of it. If Mary was on, she would know it's a, Lipa something, blah, blah, blah. And that is a butterfly expert. And um, out of Davis, because he said, if you, I don't care what kind of milkweed you have, feed the monarchs, you know, just don't cut it back uh, in the fall. I would say like October, November, because we have, well, we have five generations typically here in California because it, it's a longer period of time. And that last generation cannot keep, you know, cannot think, if you will, that they're, it's not going away because that's when you start messing with the migration. They need to migrate. So once that milkweed starts going away, the sources start going away, they take off and they go to their coastal areas here. They don't fly to Mexico from California. Okay. So um, this kind of milkweed, however, in my experience, does not last, uh, it's not as robust. And when you, when you take clippings of it, it just kind of flops. Um, there's a red kind and a yellow kind. Um, they're both beautiful plants. But, um, and I have a ton of these because that's what I had originally. And I have a lot of, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Well, a lot of babies from last year. Um, and, uh, but I also really like the, um, the showy milkweed. So the showy milkweed um, is this one. And what's so great about it is that the leaves are very thick. And you take a few leaves and you take part of that stem and you stick it in water or just a leaf. Like I cut a leaf so that 
I'll cut a leaf so there's still some stem left on the leaf because I don't, if I can, I want to keep the plant going, right? We're only in the second generation here, okay? Finishing up. And I'll put that in, in some water. I put it in a little, um, uh, you know, those little tubes, you know, for single flowers. And that, that's, that's what I use. So <clears throat> those things are extremely helpful when I'm, uh, 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 trying to make that leaf last a little bit longer if it's not in my, you know, that container. So once they graduate from the container, then I'm putting them on bigger leaves and bigger containers out on the, out on my uh, deck. And so if we can get them in some kind of water source, that's going to, that's going to be better. Okay, so <clears throat> California uh, has, let me go to the, that showy milkweed, showy, tropical. So on this, it says grow milkweed plants and here it has the 12 uh, California milkweeds. And um, the ones I've had the most experience with are the showy milkweed, which I like a lot. I've had a lot of tropical milkweed, done fine with that. One of the big issues is aphids, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but I haven't had personal experience with any of these other ones with the exception of one of these is also called hairy balls. Now, <laughs> I don't remember which one of these has that common name but it literally looks like that. So when it flowers, it has balls about this side and they're with like what appears to be hairs coming out of it. So that's where it got its name. And uh, I have had that plant, but I can tell you that when I have that plant next to a tropical, they go for tropical. Uh, but that said, they'll eat any, any milkweed is fine. They'll eat it and uh, they will do well on it. And in fact, when people have run out of milkweed, They've used pumpkin and a few other things that apparently very, very hungry last in star. In star means the, you know, they, they shed and they become another in star. And they're in the fourth and fifth in star that they will eat other things. I've never tried that, I'm just saying. But now I've been on next door and I have all these sources. I'm so excited. Okay, so um, I'm gonna share what a couple people in my group of said, and then a couple other thoughts. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about aphids. Uh, I just dealt with some aphids today. You've got to regularly check your uh, plants. I keep most of my plants, I have about 40 plants, I keep them in uh, containers because <clears throat> then I can transfer them out. So when the um, uh, so I can transfer them out when they're eaten down and then I can put some fresh ones out in the yard. So I keep enough out in the yard where eggs will still continue to be laid, which happened today. So I've got about 30 more new eggs. My, my yard right now is self-sustaining, except I don't have enough to completely feed the level of monarchs laying in my, in my yard. So aphids, um, I just watched a video before this, uh, for doing this, and I, you know, I've always heard, you know, just spray water on the, you know, on the aphids, you know, spray it, spray them off the plant. I'm thinking, wait a minute, they're just going to climb back on the plant. Well, the symptomologist said, no, they can't do that. They're very soft and they're, and I was just kind of shocked, but he said no, because I've been like cutting off the section and spraying it with alcohol and doing all this other stuff. And he said, no, you just have to spray it with water and you just keep at it. Uh, I manage my, all the uh, aphids now by hand, and uh, meaning that I catch it before it gets bad. Sometimes I'll just squish them on the plant, but now I also know if they if I get a stem that has a lot on it, I can do that. But um, honestly, what I do is I kind of kill them by hand, and I'll take that little clipping, put it off, and feed it to the cats because it, it's not going to hurt the cats; it hurts the plant. Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> a 
the question here is about uh, OE, which is a, a parasite that infects butterflies. And this is the big concern throughout the country. Um, it's more rare in northern uh, areas, and um, it's much more common in, uh, say, the south and so forth. And Southern California, I at least heard a talk today on it saying they're having a lot of trouble with OE. So what can you do about that? Um, you can, um, I'm going to just say it and then I'll talk about it more, but you can bleach the leaves uh, by, that you're going to be feeding to the, um, to the, to the um, uh, caterpillars and they, you dip it into this bleach solution, uh, very dilute and for like three seconds or something like that, as well as an egg. You do that with the eggs too, because when the, if there's an infection, by the way, I'm not actually recommending this, I'm telling you about it, because I'll tell you why in a minute, but you're gonna read this. Um, and the female can have, be infected, even though they can look really fine, lay an egg, and on top of the egg, lay the spores for these parasites. That's why it's so dangerous. So um, I have a microscope and I have tested a lot of butterflies before release. I was doing all of them initially. I did not find one case of OE because what you'll see, because I have to hold the butterfly and take tape on, on the belly of it, get some scales off. And in those scales, if it was infected, there would be these spores. And you can look, all this stuff, by the way, you can look at YouTube, you know how that is. There's everything over there. And there's a guy named uh, Science Lund. Um, actually, if you're listening, Robin, maybe you could in the chat uh, post what his name is because he's got a lot of good information. But anyway, um, do we really need to do it? Um, I'm going to send everybody an email. I'm going to do a little more research because even they disagree on what the ratio is. Some say 1 to 40, 1 to 20 blah, blah, blah. So I'll get you that information. I, I definitely feel if I was in an area where we were having a lot of it, that I would feel definitely responsible to do it that way, to, to bleach them and all that. But I had a question that I posed to my group and I didn't really get a satisfactory answer. I think I need to talk, actually I know an entomologist, I need to call her and talk to her. But if you bleach a leaf, you're killing everything on that leaf, including that spore. Well, maybe some of those things on that leaf are actually good for the butterfly, and we don't know that. Now, the analogy would be, but not really a good one, is that children, you know, they're sticking stuff in their mouth all the time to develop a good immune system. And maybe what they're talking about developing healthy monarchs, um, you might not want to do that. So I think there's some things that just aren't known to my satisfaction anyway. Um, and maybe what I'm going to do, and I'm glad I'm talking about this, I can get an entomologist and I can interview that entomologist. As many of you know, I do interviews practically weekly and so forth on uh, various health topics. But anyway, um, so I don't really recommend that right now in our area. I think we're pretty good. And I'll let you know if I start seeing it. And so will Robin. Uh, Robin tests as well. But we're not seeing it. So I don't think any of you who are just beginning need to run out and do all this stuff. I think you can happily, you know, raise a few of them, you know, 12. You know, you get a couple different containers, you know, clean the containers in between. I haven't even done that. I'm just going to be honest with you because I haven't seen it. So I think we can be, uh, we can be cautious, but... Uh, I just, I just don't think it's necessary right now. And ultimately, you know, when I look at my, how I'm doing in terms of um, monarchs, 98, 99% of my monarchs make it, as opposed to only 5% in the wild, and they're healthy. Uh, and if they're not, and you have to euthanize them, you take and put them in a little uh, you know, wax baggie, put it in the freezer. That's the best way to do it. And... Um, uh, and it's important. You don't want to release uh, unhealthy 
monarchs into the population. But they're going to get there anyway. You know, if they're landing on all these plants everywhere, right? So I think in my yard, they had a better chance just in general. Uh, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to say, and then hopefully we can open up for questions. Um, <clears throat> talked about the aphids. Uh, oh yeah, and cut back. Okay, so I think that's about what I want to say right now. And I will be getting back to everyone because I have everyone's email. Uh, maybe in about a week, I'm going to actually talk to an entomologist about the uh, bleaching and so forth. Um, I, but I would just, my advice right now is not to worry. That's what I would say. Because you'll be reading lots of different things. So what I want to try to do, you know, this is um, a little different than when I do meetings where I can just see everybody. And um, I, I can't, you know, I don't see everybody. So you have to guess, turn your, your pictures on. Um, and if you have any questions, I would really like to oh, unmute yourselves, unmute yourselves and um, raise your hand if you want to say something, talk to me, and then I can select you. So there's a way to uh, raise your hand. Okay, anyone want to say anything? Oh, Kathy, good, okay. Yeah, Kathy, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So should I start talking? Sounds good. Yes, yeah, so I just have to say, Kathy and I went to junior high and high school together. <laughs> <laughs> it's really wonderful being a part of this, Lonnie. So thank you so much. So I live in Santa Cruz, and I work with Natural Bridges um, State Park with the Monarchs. I was kind of like responsible for setting up displays in the visitor center. I'm a retired school teacher and I bought tropical milkweed and found that there were so many caterpillars and eggs and butterflies in my backyard that I started working at Natural Bridges at, at, in the visitor center. And um, I learned a lot about what we're talking about tonight, but I did find that there was a lot of OE. Unfortunately, sometimes there'd be one out of 15 butterflies that would be healthy. So consequently, I had a big cage at the visitor center at Natural Bridges where there was a lot of butterflies that were infected, which is really sad. So I kept telling everybody to cut their milkweed down on November the 1st, and some of my friends um, cut it down, but then there was more that grew, and the butterflies, of course the females, desperate for a milkweed, leaf so she laid the eggs and then these people I helped with more milkweed but all of those butterflies were infected every single butterfly and that was about three months ago and there was probably 20 butterflies that were infected so um, I'm going to kind of take it upon myself to be real vigilant with the nurseries in Santa Cruz and with the public in Santa Cruz to tell them to cut the milkweed down on November the 1st because the, the females are ready to lay their eggs and if they find milkweed, they're not going to migrate. So that's... That's right. Yeah. Well, and the other thing I wanted to ask you, um, mm -hmm. my understanding is that OE gets worse, which would kind of make sense through the, uh, through the year. To, and at the end, it's worse. But you're saying that... And what's interesting is here you are in Santa Cruz, not far from me. I've got a microscope. I haven't seen any. But in Santa Cruz, you're seeing a lot. So do you have any thoughts on that? Um, all I can think of is what you were saying is the longer the leaf is around, the more infected the leaves get. We were washing our milkweed in soap, soap and water, um, trying to get the OE off of the milkweed. So, and is that as effective as using the bleach solution? I, I, I like that idea better. I don't know. You know, Lonnie, I've never used the bleach on the leaves. I've used the bleach solution with the eggs and put the eggs under the microscope to see if the OE was on the eggs and kept washing the eggs until there, weren't, there wasn't any OE. But um, I've never heard of bleaching the leaves. So that's, that's really interesting to me. Oh, yeah. No, a lot of people do. I'm in a group where a lot of them bleach every leaf because it's bad in their areas um, and, and the eggs as well. Um, did you ever, did you ever actually see the spores on top of an egg? 
Yes. Wow. Oh yeah. There's like wow. three or four or five sometimes on each egg. And then, so we just continually, continuously washed the egg until it was OE free. Wow. Well, I'm really glad you're sharing this. But So let me ask you, you've had a different experience than me. Mm -hmm. um, would you, in my area, if you weren't seeing it, would you be as vigilant as you are now? Or do you think that you might feel a little more relaxed like I do at this point? Because I do check, but you know, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing any, any in the ones I'm releasing. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, if you're not seeing it, Lonnie, I think it's, it's good to release them, I guess. I mean, today I couldn't get a hold of the head ranger at Natural Bridges and I had three monarchs that emerged and I couldn't get a hold of a microscope. So rather than keep them in the cage in my house, I just let them go today but i i really kind of agree with you i mean these monarchs i gave them milkweed that was in a greenhouse at, from natural bridges that didn't have any contact with any other butterfly so that those to that to me those butterflies were definitely oe free but um yeah and I, you do the testing method as well obviously with the tape and the yeah and you get good at it after a while mm -hmm. but i think that um I'm wondering if you agree with me because we have a lot of people, a number of people here that are friends of mine that are, you know, starting small and I'm going along with what the, um, uh, the folks, you know, the venture folks are saying, which is just keep the amount that you're doing um, at a low count, do it responsibly, keep it clean. And it's a good thing to do. Yeah, I, I agree, Lonnie. It, it is kind of, a tough call, but I think if you are kind of continuously testing some of your butterflies to make sure that they're healthy, I think it's a good thing that you're releasing them. I, there's such a, there, it's difficult, you know, like I went to this one meeting and they were saying we're loving them to death. And that was kind of a difficult thing to hear, but I also really liked what you said about the person that you spoke to saying that they are endangered now and the, and the, the best the more that we can help them, the better. And I, I really liked that you said that. Yeah, and I think, again, it's um, <clears throat> how we're doing it. And mm -hmm. um, uh, my, you know, we're not talking, I mean, the, the, the thing that a lot of these folks are talking about is the breeders or people who have, I mean, I do as many as 100 or, well, I've done as many as 500 a year, but that's over the full span. And I know what I'm doing. I've been doing it a long time. Um, but I do think that, um, again, just doing the basic practices, even that Venture recommends, is good. And if I'm test, the, the, I would find it on their scales if they have right. the OE. And it, so, therefore, they are absolutely fine to release unless they I look sick. I really do. I, I, it sounds really encouraging to me, Lonnie. It's just... When I was doing this in Santa Cruz, there was so much disease. It was, it's been really difficult, really difficult. Oh yeah, and when you see that much, it's, uh, I'm sure, difficult. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Kathleen, and uh, um, I'd love to connect outside of here too, so thank you for- Yeah, I have a little present for you, so I need to get your address. Oh, good, oh, good. <laughs> excellent, okay. Anyone else have any questions? Or Robin, I know you've been doing this for a while too, and. Maybe you'd like to uh, say something, Robin. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay. Okay. So the name of the guy who um, has a gazillion videos on YouTube is Rich Lund. First name R I C H, last name L U N D. And I find it valuable just to whip through, you know, um, some of his uh, videos. You can you know, be, or, be very specific about um, what you want to be watching and you can, you know, put it in your uh, search um, for uh, monarch butterflies, you know, the topic that you wanted to review, want to review and, um, and then find it that way. Um, I, I do have a, I do have a question. Um, so, because I'm just starting now to plant um, uh, milkweed. 
So if you cut back your milkweed, and I, and I read somewhere that you should be cutting it back to six inches, how long do you keep it cut back? November through when? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Kathleen, do you know the answer to that? What I did was I cut it right to the soil on November the 1st. Wow. And, and right now it's coming back. I have, I have a bush. In fact, in fact, like a month ago, I had like four or five leaves that were growing out of the soil. And this beautiful little butterfly flew around my yard and and made a beeline to those four little leaves in my backyard that were so small. I don't know, you know, they have good antenna or something like that for the milkweed, but um, yeah. So then the other thing is there was, I had a lot of milkweed that dispersed seeds in my backyard. So I have a lot of um, volunteers right now happening in my backyard too. But um, I think that it really needs to be cut right to the soil. It's a weed, it'll come back. And what, what kind do you use? Mostly? I have I have tropical. That's how I started. But then recently I just got the snowy, uh, showy milkweed too. And I planted it two days ago and I walked out this morning and it's covered with aphids already. How do those aphids know? I know. It's great. Well, you know what? It came from the store that way. So, um, oh. okay. Yeah. You know, on big plants, Kathy, I actually spray them with alcohol, but you have eggs, if you don't, if you don't have eggs on it or anything, and uh, if they're healthy, big plants, it, it actually withstands it. But I don't know, I haven't done it to show, I've done it to tropical, where I just spray the plant. I had a plant completely covered with aphids. I sprayed alcohol, straight alcohol, top and bottom, did not harm the plant, mm. and it was fine. But I didn't, wouldn't give it to the, you know, the... Uh, set it out for eggs for another month, but it, it actually saved the entire plant. So mm. yeah, so that's a good thing to remember. I think that's a good point is um, October, excuse me, um, November 1st, cutting everything back and just, and you, so like you keep it cut throughout the winter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you I keep cutting it back or you just let it go and then well, I cut it down and then it didn't come back until recently. So I see. Okay. Okay, great. Well, I my favorite milkweed so far is the showy milkweed. It really lasts, the leaves are really thick. It'll feed like three or four caterpillars for quite a while. Um, I really do you have you have any of that, Kathy? No, I just bought some, so I just planted three plants of that. So it'll oh, be fun. yeah. No, they're they're really great, I have to say. I love that one. So does anyone else have any questions before we go? Uh, Rebecca, so unmute yourself. Rebe oh, wait, uh, Rich and Jerry, go ahead and speak. Hi, this is Rich. Hey, Rich. I have a question. Do monarchs winter in Berkeley? You know, it's interesting. We had that happened, it was a real fluke. A few, some years ago in Aquatic Park, they made a little, I don't even know what you call those things, the hanging things, uh, but that was a fluke. So um, there's a site where Kathy works down in uh, at Bridges. Uh, they go to the coast and it's usually more in the Southern areas. So uh, I think usually the, the closest area is gonna be Santa Cruz, but San Luis Obispo has a big area um, and Kathy, maybe you know of some other um, uh, areas that, uh, besides San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara has a big one, and Santa Cruz. Do you know of any others? Uh, Pismo Beach. Oh, yeah, Pismo Beach is big. Yeah. And um, by the way, I do want to show a picture of um, that, uh, of This is what it looks like to, uh, Robin took this photo uh, to look at, you're looking for spores here and there are no spores. These is just a healthy scales from the, um, from the monarch. But if there were spores in there, we would be seeing it. And this is one of her photos. The spores look like pepper. Yeah, they do. They look like pepper in there, but this is all I've been seeing is healthy looking, Wonderful. you know, like this, so. Yay. 
Anyone else, any questions you'd like to pop out? You have any other questions, Rich? Um, yeah, I just unmuted again. Um, so we, we picked up a couple of tiny uh, milkweed plants from next door last uh, spring of 2019, let them grow. We sort of ignored them. And then in December, we found a couple of caterpillars. We said, oh boy, that's, this is great. Let's, let's grow some butterflies. But it leads me to wonder, was that an unnatural occurrence? And, and what was unnatural there? You well, mean? Because, because uh, this was December. Oh, and yeah. Me, and, and the plant was doing just fine. It was big. Well, there, that, that kind of goes with what Kathy was saying. It should have been cut down. So the last generation of, um, and this is what the uh, people who are real purists about all this are concerned about, because they have to, the, the, the monarchs have to get the clue that there's no food, because the last generation does not mate. And that's a clue. Way. That's a clue for them to then go to their wintering site. By the way, this was a common milkweed. It was not the tropical. Oh, well, you know what, Rich? I bet a lot of the milkweeds in this area would sustain through the winter. As plants do here in Canada. Yeah, Canada. yeah, and plants just do here. So we do, but we do have less of the OE typically, but then we have Kathy telling us down in Santa Cruz there that they've just been inundated with it this year. So um, we just have to be, I guess, on the lookout for it. Okay. Um, and, um, but to be honest, Rich, I, I was not too aware of this whole thing either about, you know, getting rid of the milkweed. Um, and I would let it grow for the winter. And sometimes we'd have a hot spell in January to be laying eggs. So I didn't know that that wasn't a good thing. And um, it's kind of hard not to provide food when you see them flying around, but uh, I guess it's better to do that, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. And I wanted to show you just a couple. I wanted to show you um, just because this is a cool shot here. This is a one of my um, pipe fine butterflies. Aren't these gorgeous? So these are butterflies that um, sometimes I just do for fun because they they, they come on my um, passion flower plants. So they're also called passion flower butterflies or Gulf fritillaries, but um, sometimes people mistake these for monarchs because from the back they're orange, but they fly super, super fast. But they're just gorgeous and uh, wanted to share that one. Thank you. I love that. I love fritillaries. Aren't they gorgeous? You know, we had so many fritillaries in Castro Valley too, Lonnie. And this year? And when we were growing up, swallowtail oh, yeah. monarchs and so many fritillaries too. Oh, they're Wonderful. Well, we had so many of everything back then. Um, yeah. You know, we just, uh, I just remember so many butterflies growing up. Um, and yeah, we're just very sparse now. I do want to show one more uh, photo real quick, and then we'll... That last photo was beautiful. Yeah. Well, here I was... Um, this guy was crawling up my shirt. This I'm wearing this t-shirt of the wolf. And this butterfly crawls up and ends up there. And I got the picture. This is a selfie of my shirt and the monarch butterfly. <laughs> Beautiful. I know, isn't that crazy? Mm -hmm. I love that shot. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody. Well, unless anyone's got other questions, we'll call it a night. And I hope this was helpful to everybody. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. And it's so encouraging that lots of other people are interested in saving this beautiful creature that we're crazy about. So it's really fun being in this group. Thank you, Lonnie. All right. Thank you, Kathy. Take care. Good night. Good night. Good night, Lonnie. Good night.